Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and with great might come among us, and because we are sorely hindered by our sins, let your bountiful grace and mercy speedily help and deliver us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. This is from Zephaniah 3, 14 through 20. Sing aloud, O daughter Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing as on a day of festival. I will remove disaster from you so that you will not bear reproach for it. I will deal with all your oppressors at that time. And I will save the lame and gather the outcast. And I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you home, at the time when I gather you, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. We'll read Canticle 9, the first song of Isaiah, alternately, responsibly, by whole verse. Surely it is God who saves me. I will trust in him and not be afraid, for the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense, and he will be my savior. And on that day you shall say, Give thanks to the Lord and call on his name. Make his deeds known among the peoples. See that they remember that his name is exalted. Sing the praises of the Lord, for he has done great things, and this is known in all the world. Cry aloud, inhabitants of Zion. Ring out your joy, for the great one in the midst of you is the Holy One of Israel. The second reading is from Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory Glory to you, Lord Christ. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? 
In reply, he said to them, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even the tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, teacher, what should we do? He said to them, collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, and we, what should we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I'm not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Abide in me, Lord Christ, and I in you. Please be seated. It's hard to believe that it's the third Sunday of Advent, the Sunday when we get to light the pink candle on our Advent wreath, Gaudet Sunday, from the Latin word meaning rejoice. And yet, Having settled into our school routine, at least for us, our routines of the late fall and early late summer and into the fall and rounding into the winter, it's hard to imagine. And yet here we are. We've gone through those routines week after week. We've become comfortable in them. We know kind of how they go. And somehow or another, I think many of us anyway are surprised it's already the third Sunday of Advent. How can this be? And yet here we are. One of my favorite routines that I have settled into this since this past school year has started is uh, begin, well, is on Friday, I should say. And it begins when I don my apron and I'm greeted with the smell of popcorn in the school cafetorium. Now, if you're not familiar with the cafetorium is, it's the cafeteria and the auditorium put together into the cafetorium. And at Woodland Hills, anyway, it is known as popcorn and pickles, which is a long-standing PTA money-generating tradition that's been around for decades, I'm told. And I am one of the popcorn ladies. In fact, I'm recognized as that sometimes, and it's kind of fun. So that's the beginning of my, you know, sort of known, established, I'm into the routines, they're comfortable to me, I get to go be the popcorn lady on Fridays, and then there's some errands to run, of course, uh, typically. This last Friday, I got to take a short trip with my mom to Oklahoma City, I dropped her off for a car, I got to go to a short appointment, and uh, then I got to see some friends for just a little bit before I headed back to pick up the kids at school. And being Friday, and knowing that it was movie night, I picked up some pizza on the way, picked up the kids, and I was especially thankful that it had been predetermined what the Friday night movie was going to be before we got to school, before we even left school that morning. We already knew what it was, so we weren't going to have to listen to the arguing back and forth, because it had been determined we were going to watch The Grinch. That's what we had decided. So that's what we did. Pizza in hand, we picked up, I picked up the kids and we arrived home, pulled into the garage, turned on our outdoor Christmas lights, and we shut the garage door and we settled in after a long week, of course, week after week, of course, and we began to enjoy our Friday night movie. <sighs> right? <laughs> And I think it's into a scene such as this. Now, granted, this is 2,000 years 
earlier, but it's a comfortable scene that we know so well. And I think it's the same comfortable as you could be anyway with the people who had gathered to hear John the Baptist. And they come into this sort of encounter with John the Baptist, quite comfortable, probably, you know, knowing we know who showed up there. And, and they were greeted with, you brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And suddenly they're jolted out of their comfortable place that they had been settled into nicely. And I know how that feels because I do it every week on Friday evening. And they heard John. <sighs> it's jarring. And I, I can only imagine how these people had felt because... Who would like to be called a brood of vipers to start with, especially when you think you're pretty comfortable uh, in the get-go? And yet they had sought him out, the religious authorities. Now, maybe some of them wanted to know what was going on. I think maybe some of them were trying to do a little research to see who this guy was that was stirring up all of this following, and was he a threat to them, and what, how might they want to address this? Uh, so, you know, th there was a mix of religious authorities there, let's say. There were the faithful that were there as well. There were tax collectors that were there and soldiers. And these were people that lived a pretty cushy, sort of comfortable life. And yet, for some reason, something must have been gnawing them because they left their place of comfort. They got off their sofa, they went outside their door, they followed to go and see John the Baptist in the desert. It's, John the Baptist did not, as we know, come into the populated areas. He was not known for that. That's not where his community lived. So they went out to him and they were seeking him out. They had left that comfortable place and for some reason they determined, let's go listen to John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist, we know him um, as the kind of wild man who probably had some honey and cricket legs or grasshopper legs in his beard, and uh, he didn't wear much, whatever he could find. Some of tradition um, understands him as being from the Essene community, which were big reformers. They were not happy with the religious authority. They had removed themselves off into the desert sort of caves to live and to pray and to live an ascetic life. It's tradition and it's plausible. It makes sense that that was John's community. They were around from about 200 BC to, to 200 CE. Uh, and then that's right when John lived. And so here these people go out into the hinterlands and uh, looking for John the Baptist uh, for whatever reason, that's where they went. And they wanted to know the question of what should we do? He greets them, you brood of vipers. Okay, and then they still ask him, okay, well then what should we do? Now the religious authority, you can look and follow along here in the gospel. He says, just because you think you're the, the uh, children of Abraham, don't think that that gets you like the golden ticket to get through the door. Um, what was compelling about Abraham and, and, that, and, and what uh, was the model that Abraham was is because he lived a life of faith with integrity. And you can see why John the Baptist might wonder if the religious authority of the day were really doing that or if they were just serving their own purpose. Then there were some faithful who showed up and he said, look, if you have an extra coat, give it to someone who needs it. He didn't say give away everything. He just said give from excess, give from your excess. And if you have extra food, share it. Then the tax collectors ask him, okay, what then should we do? And John the Baptist says, collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Be honest. <laughs> Don't take advantage of people. And then, of course, just in case he might give a different answer, the soldiers ask John the Baptist, what then should we do? And his answer does not change. His answer to the soldiers says, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation and be satisfied with your wages. Be honest. Don't take advantage of people. 
do what you need to do, take care of business, and then move on. For John, it's that simple. Somehow, I guess, coming out of an ascetic lifestyle is pretty clarifying, I guess, for John the Baptist about what it means to get ready for the Messiah to arrive, which is what he's talking about. He, 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 he shuns the idea of he being the Messiah. They ask him that later. He says, oh, no, 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 no. He just wants the people to prepare and bear fruits worthy of repentance, and that's what he opens his uh, teaching to with them when they arrive. And for John, it really and truly, I think, is that simple. And it leaves me asking the question, is it really that simple? Yes and no. Yes and no. John remind us every, reminds us every year during Advent that we can't get to Christmas without hearing from him every year. Just like the people who sought him out probably knew what he was going to say by reputation, we too know that we're not going to get through Advent without hearing from John the Baptist and his fiery, tell it like it is, way of being in the world and following Christ. You all know that John the Baptist is going to be one of the people we hear from during our Advent readings as well. And you know, too, from listening to Scripture week after week, that Scripture doesn't typically comfort the comfortable. It's hard to read, it's hard to hear, and it's hard to get away from this reality. Part of which is John the Baptist coming during Advent, and then and now it echoes centuries later. And yet you all show up just like the people sought out John the Baptist, knowing probably what kind of message he was going to give them to ask the question, what then should we do? To which I think John the Baptist seems to be saying, just do what you need to do and respond to the need in front of you and keep doing it. See where it takes you. See how it opens your eyes to see more and to do more. And then just keep doing that. And out of that, we can develop fruits, as John the Baptist says, worthy of repentance, which is what he's calling us to do and to become and to bear. It's not an easy message to hear. It's not an easy message to preach on. And yet, every year during Advent, we hear John the Baptist. And you all show up to hear it and to work towards it, and to keep doing it over and over and over. And for that, I give thanks. And I think it's a reason to rejoice. So I'm thankful to be on this journey with you all, where we show up to hear messages that are not easy to hear, and to be called to task to do better, so we can see more, so that we can do more, and continue that journey towards bearing the fruits of repentance that John, in John's own way, calls us to do. And somehow, through the incarnation of Jesus Christ, we are restored and recreated to do as well. Amen. Please rise as we reaffirm our faith in the ancient words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe
I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our bishop, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the hungry, the oppressed, those in prison and the sick, especially Al, Alexander family, Blake W, Bob, Brandy, Caroline, David, Ed, Fred, the Grosskrauts family, Helen, the Huber family, Jean, Joe, John L, June, Catherine, Kelly, Chris, Lucille, Mary R, the Matz family, Pat B, Richard, the Rittenhouse family, Robert, the Rosenbaum family, Sandra, Sharon H, Sherry, Stephanie B, Terry M, Vicki, and the Williams family. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they may find and be found by him. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died, especially Scott Sprinkle. And Ann Kerr, Jean Rabs, dear friend. I ask your prayers for those who serve in the military. I ask your thanksgiving for all the blessings of this life and all those who are celebrating birthdays, especially Madsen Flores, Tina Carpenter, and Christian Flores, and an anniversary for Gus and Elizabeth Fabrega. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. grant that thy servants, who now live by faith, may with joy behold your Son at his coming in glorious majesty, even Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Jesus said, the first commandment is this, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. The second is this, Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please rise. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. I'm missing my big... Aren't you festive? I like it. <laughs> welcome. Welcome, everyone. Please be seated. It's wonderful to have you all with us this morning. It's a little bit chilly. I think it's supposed to warm up, though, so I'm glad uh, that you made it out. Uh, just two uh, quick reminders. Um, there are envelopes if you would like to uh, help purchase poinsettias for Christmas Eve services. They are in the back there. Uh, Jaime or Blake could help you out with that. Um, does it have a deadline that they need to be turned in, Jaime? I'm putting you on the spot. I don't know this off the top of my head. 
uh, it doesn't say. Okay, uh, if you could get those to us by next Sunday or Monday, that would be lovely. Um, and then we can get your name and who you've offered the flowers for in the bulletin. Um, if that's not on your list of things to be focused on, then you can get us the money after that and we'll take it then too, but <laughs> just so you know. Okay, uh, and then speaking of Coinsetta, so our Christmas Eve service this year is at 6 o'clock, as it says, and it should also say in the bulletin that we have a hymn sing at 545. Um, the Christmas season is only 12 days long, per the song, and there's lots of wonderful Christmas hymns in uh, that we can sing that we really kind of run out of time to do so. So this is a way to really enjoy them all together uh, and make sure that we get them all in. So 545, and we'll be singing out of the blue hymnal mainly, and it'll just be lovely to hold a hymnal in our hand and to be together in the nave and to be able um, to do that and to celebrate that together. Uh, so 545, hymn, sing, and six o'clock Christmas Eve service. Then the, that's Friday night. Then Sunday morning, uh, which is the first Sunday after Christmas, we will have one service at 1015. Okay. Uh, adult formation will still be happening at its regular time, nine o'clock as well. Okay. I think that's everything. So let us um, celebrate the Eucharist together and rejoice in all the gifts that God has given us. Ascribe unto the Lord the honor due God's name, bring offerings and come into God's courts. All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We praise you and we bless you, holy and gracious God, source of life abundant. From before time you made ready the creation. Your spirit moved over the deep, and brought all things into being. 
sun, moon, and stars, earth, winds, and waters, and every living thing. You made us in your image and taught us to walk in your ways, but we rebelled against you and wandered far away. And yet, as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again, you called us to live in the fullness of your love. And so this day, we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing. Please stand, sit, or kneel as is meaningful for you. Glory and honor and praise to you, holy and living God, to deliver us from the power of sin and death and to reveal the riches of your grace. You looked with favor upon Mary, your willing servant, that she might conceive and bear a son, Jesus, the holy child of God. Living among us, Jesus loved us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners, healed the sick, and proclaimed good news to the poor. He yearned to draw all the world to himself, yet we were heedless of his call to walk in love. Then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the salvation, the sacrifice of his life, and to be glorified by you. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at the table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you, gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. <coughs> now gathered at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer to you our gifts of bread and wine and ourselves, a living sacrifice. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts, that they may be, to the be the body and blood of Christ. And breathe your spirit over the whole earth, and make us your new creation, the body of Christ given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, bring us with all your saints from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to, be, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Alleluia, Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. These are the gifts of God for the people of God.
continuing to gather, let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with the spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with kindness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the peace of God that passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds and keep them in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And go with the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and always. Amen.